case, so we solve uh, real issues. Um, so, so happy to have you here and thank you, uh, Adina Gad, Nadav and Emmanuel for having me. And actually it's quite a switch because it was a pure hardware talk and now it's gonna be a pure uh, deep software talk, uh, quantum software I mean. So, um, and so we should all do this switch. Um, just one second. Good. Um, so um, I'll try to say uh, in the time I have a few ideas or things we believe in uh, coming from what we call uh, circuit synthesis. Um, I'll uh, say a few words about what we see as the quantum software challenge encompassing all types of uh, anyone who's dealing with uh, quantum software. I'll say a few words about what I mean by quantum circuit synthesis. Uh, and uh, probably the main message, the main take home message will be this part, uh, functional models or any high level models I would say compared to gate level implementation because people today think of quantum circuits as gate level implementations quite different from how people think of classical software when you write a Python code or C++ code. You don't really think of software as your, uh, below your assembly code, but this is what people think today of quantum software. So I will tell what I mean by functional models. Um, and then the challenges of creating quantum software. And as much as time permits, uh, time is, um, synonymous to Steve here, so as, as much as Steve permits some examples and results, and maybe one slide about our company, uh, so you'll be familiar. So the status of where we are, uh, so we are in the infancy, right? Writing quantum software in this way, uh, by definition means that we, that we are in the infancy of quantum software, and essentially this is how people program, of course, some building blocks are already created, but the building blocks are created from those gates, and then once they are created, people can use the building blocks. But there is no fundamental difference whether you are writing at the gate level or using a building block which someone else wrote at the gate level. Um, and as a discipline, quantum circuit design is not really existent. People write software, but with no discipline, with no methodology. And I'm saying it for good. I'm not uh, being criticized of anyone. It's just the regular evolution of a new discipline. So we are at the start. Now, this is good for here when people play around to educate themselves and to see sometimes experiment with some hardware. It also may be good for this where people start looking at different blocks. But once we scale up both in number of qubits, but not only in number of qubits, in complexity, even with a relatively small number of qubits, but once the complexity of the quantum logic becomes a little bit scaled up, uh, then we should discipline ourselves. And, and we know how to do it. I mean, some may think maybe the uh, circuit model of quantum computing, quantum computing decided to go on a circuit model and not on a, say, a functional model. Maybe that's the issue, but that's not the issue because we write hardware we don't write a software in a circuit model, but we do write hardware, classical hardware in a circuit model, and we know that classical hardware is certainly the most complex man-made entity on Earth by far, and we can deal with it. It's a circuit model, but we can deal with high-level languages of describing of the functionality of the circuit model at all levels. This is a telescopic model. And the only point is that this is human consum consumable and also human writable. This is not. So we need this small arrow of, automa arrow of more automation to take us from the human, uh, the expert, I would say, possible parts. An expert can write this and bring their knowledge into something which, of course, is non-consumable by a human. There are 10 billion gates here but they provide this logic. So that's the point here. 
and this would be a quantum model, this would be a gate level implementation of a circuit model, of a quantum circuit. Those are the building blocks, but now generated automatically, just as quantum hardware is generated automatically from high level hardware models. Um, so first question, raise of hands, who recognizes this? Wake up, who recognizes this? Okay. So, so I don't mean you to say Shaw's algorithm, I mean you to tell me what page on the book of Nielsen and Chuang it is taken out of. So, so, so we all seen this. This is the functional model of Shaw's algorithm. And that's enough for Nielsen and Chuang and for anyone writing academic papers, it describes everything. And we know it works because classical logic can be implemented in quantum logic and it's enough to say this. Now raise of hands, but I will tell you the answer before you answer. The answer is no one who have ever seen an implementation, a working implementation of a Shor's algorithm. So the answer is no one. Maybe on five qubits, maybe on 17 qubits, but very structured. No one ever seen a, an implementation of the modular exponentiation here, which is reasonable in any definition of the word reasonable, and what you're going to see here is the first time. Why? Because we use automation to do this very, very, very difficult aspect or difficult part of the Shor's algorithm. So this is a functional model written in paper which is not executable. You cannot take an academic paper or the Nielsen and Schwank book, push it into machinery and create a quantum circuit, although it is correct. This is an interface a graphical interface in this case, we'll see a textual interface for doing the same. So we see the H's, we see the inverse Fourier transform, we see the modular exponentiation. This modular exponentiation, I can tell you, is telescopically very deep in terms of implementation. So you must model this uh, part telescopically deep, but you can do it and it's quite easy. And this part is executable. And once you execute it, you get this gate level circuit and this is the beginning of an actual gate level circuit of a Shor algorithm, and this is scalable and complex. I'll say one more word about this. This is an academic implementation of the Shor's algorithm. Now, keep in mind how simple this is in Nielsen and Schwank book. Here you start to see the complexity. This is an implementation of part, small part of the modular exponentiation here. And they wrote a paper, a good paper, a good implementation of Shor's algorithms. There are other implementations as well. Everything is on paper. And you cannot execute, and also the authors of the paper, they don't have any intention to execute this paper. So, but once we reach there and we want to execute Shor's algorithm, we need to model it. So this is an exact model of this paper. Once again, each structure here is telescopic. And once you have the model, you can move into a textual model if you want. This and this are the same, and both are executable. And once you execute, you get this execution of the paper. So take the academic paper, take the ideas. This is what the experts are good at. Push into automation the ability, this is the continued circuit, and so on, at the gate level. So same for, I won't repeat, same for Oracle. This is a Grover algorithm, very simple algorithm. After it was invented, it is simple, but uh, as for any quantum algorithm, by the way, I could show HHL, could show answer sets, complex answer sets, or FQEs. There is a part that needs to be implemented, and it's how, in this case, the oracle. So here is the oracle. Anything which uh, uh, results in true for this expression on three registers, A plus five, whatever, will give a, a one flag to the ancilla, anything zero, anything is false will give a zero, and if there is a superposition in this expression between true and false, we'll see a superposition here. The oracle is how to implement, so this is an implementation, automatic implementation of oracle. So this was the first thing, what we mean by functional model compared to automatic implementation. Second, once you know your functional model, there are many ways to implement the implementations. So this is an implementation of the oracle on 25 qubits. The same functionality, the exact same functionality, no change in the functionality at all. Another implementation on 36 qubits. Both of them are not man-made, it's hard to do it. But once a machinery makes it, the machinery doesn't care. 
It can look at all implementations, and then dynamically now think of the big picture of a large circuit. It has many structures. This is scaling up in complexity. It has many parts, and there is our resources to manage. How many qubits this part, that part? What is the depth? How many C0 gates, if you care about noise, on that part and that part? What is the accuracy of each part? All this management can be done dynamically between the different implementations of any subpart of the circuit. So this is what the talk is about. Uh, I hope I made it clear enough. And a little bit discussing this, so we have block level decisions. Block level, this is the hardware term. In our case, maybe the functional. <coughs> like you have a QFT, you have a header, you have a multiplier, you have whatever you have. This, each one of them is a block. Each block can be implemented very differently in many ways with the same functionality. I'm not touching the functionality. Um, you can give each block zero or many number of auxiliaries. Um, different levels of accuracy. Accuracy is the only place where I play with the functionality, but only as the user allows me, um, and get the same function, the same, the same function with different implementations. So this is the game here. And of course, from the outside, you have a machine with a specific number of qubits, with a required runtime. Um, all this qubit management and reuse are parts of the considerations here. And now you need to explore your design space to come up with, you know, the most uh, uh, coherent uh, answer. And maybe formalizing a little bit in mathematical terms, there, are, there is automation already today in quantum software, of course. We all use it. Sometimes it's called transpilers, compilers, whatever. What those guys do, first, is very important, because this is how your software will um, uh, coincide with a particular hardware. Without this automation, without a transpiler, you could not run it on any particular hardware. But what it does, it gets a gate level implementation of a circuit and transforms it into a different gate level implementation of a circuit, which may be even more optimized. But, and this is a mathematical statement, a transpiler must conform to the semantics of the gate level implementation that it got at the input. It must produce a correct result and correct from a transpiler point of view is the gate level uh, implementation. Meaning is the gate level, you know, semantics. Meaning that it does not know if any particular qubit at any point in time is an auxiliary qubit. It does not know whether at this block it can do it more approximated or less approximated. It is not in the mandate of a transpiler. So, saying it in different words, this is an entire legal, functional space from the point of view of the algorithm designer. They wanted some function to run. This is the implementation, one implementation point a transpiler sees or a compiler sees, and it is allowed to play around as long as the function of the actual input is correct. Whereas going top down, from a functional model, not starting from an implementation, going from a functional model and using, well, again, automation, but a different type of automation, what the hardware people call synthesis or a synthesis tool, you can reach out very different implementations, very far away from each other, all implementing the same function. So, so this is the message of this discussion here. And I think we can go on to examples. I think it was quite clear because I understood what I was saying, um, <laughs> but uh, still examples are always in place. So anyone who's dealt with uh, quantum software, where's Hagai? Hagai, other than hardware things, do you also do software? Did you ever write a quantum software algorithm? Uh, is it a trick question? <laughs> no, just for me to know. So, so hopefully also the hardware persons try writing algorithms and anyone who has wrote a quantum algorithm by themselves know that the power horse is the, what we call multi-control X's, extended toffolies, so X at the bottom and control. Um, it appears in all uh, realistic algorithms. So in this case, seven control qubits 
uh, one X at the bottom. All of them needs to be one in order for the X to operate. Uh, can be the other way around. All of them need to be zero in order for the X to operate. And of course, any combination, some need to be one, some zero, appears in all realistic quantum algorithms. Obviously, you need at least eight qubits because those are the functional qubits. We are not playing with functionality. The functional requires eight qubits. Seven control. And this, this is an implementation, actually an optimal implementation of an eight qubit multi-control X. Uh, require on eight qubits. Requires 380 CNOT gates, depth of 635. On a computer which has only two qubit gates, of course. If a computer has eight qubit gate, uh, that's fine, but that's for someone else to build such a computer. On the other hand, you can use, sorry, you can use nine qubits with a different implementation. Same functionality on the first eight qubits, one ancilla, and a different implementation for the same functionality. 11 qubits, same functionality, 11 qubits. If we look at the table with eight qubits, 380 and such and such circuit X, with 11 qubits, 36 CNOT gates, 46 day. Now everyone knows this, nothing new here, but taking the particular MCX and in a typical circuit, even in small circuits, even in an answers for a VQE that we've heard about, you have two, three, four, maybe 10 MCXs, very small number, but playing around with them and for the same functionality, deciding whether we are now starting on qubits, so we will use the eight qubit implementation or whether we are have enough qubits and starving on noise. So let's reduce the C notes and so on. This is a decision that people today, if they get to it, do by hand very tediously. And, and this is the start of automation, of real automation. This is the start of real synthesis tools as synthesis tools have begun for hardware. Another example, and each example will teach us something new. Um, so quantum adder. Again, appears uh, in Shore in multiple uh, in modular exponentiation, in Grover in the Oracle, in HHL in the implementation of the linear equation. Any, any place you go, there is these things that can be done. That, that's the mathematical statement. They can be done, therefore they are. Uh, the, the issue of doing them. So uh, three bit addition, we have two registers, input registers of size three qubits each, and the function adder. Now we synthesize it. Again, we see the trade-offs. Usually people use a ripple carry, that's the classical adder. They use a, a ripple carry, a quantum version of it. But you can get the results in place instead of one of the inputs, or you can get the result out of place depending on whether you have, you are limited in your qubits, or you can push the result out of place and not do any uncomputation. Uncomputation is expensive. So, but you can also use a QFT header. Do the addition in Fourier space. What um, so you have A plus B equals C. You can put your C in quantum, it's a little bit different. You need the XOR of the C, the XOR of the result, forget about it. You can put the C instead of one of the inputs, and you say qubits, or you could put the C on other qubits. If you do the second, you wasted qubits. If you do the first, you needed to do a computation of the B to not have entanglement between your inputs and anything. You, you have to do this carefully. And of course, machinery should do it for you. Added in Fourier space, completely different algorithm, same functionality. Uh, depending, it has trade-offs, depending where you want to do what. Um, and computation, we mentioned it, but let's look at it closer. So we have now, this is the oracle that we want to implement, A times B plus C plus D, whatever, equals one. This is, you know, part of the larger circuit. It's written here as well. Um, if you have enough qubits, I, I'm stressing the idea of qubits, but it's, it's, it's encompassing about all your resources, all your computational resources. You can do the multiplication. First, you do a multiplication here. Then you do the first addition here. This is an adder. Both cases the same. Now you need to do another addition. If you want, you can parallelize between the computation of the multiplier and the addition. You save time because you did things in parallel. Or if you don't have enough qubits to do in parallel, you can first uncompute the multiplier and then do the addition. So deeper circuit or wider circuit. 
And those are very miniature examples in the context of a large circuits. A person should not do it. Machinery should do it. Approximation, yeah. That's the first time that I will touch also superconductivity because I was told it was a confirmed. By the way, some of the speakers cheated. I, I heard them. They talked about quantum information and all superconductivity. So I, 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 I try to abide by the law. So that's where they. So, 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 um, state preparation. Again, a basic structure in all algorithms. Sometimes you start only with HS, uniform superposition, but sometimes you want your algorithm to start in a more complex um, state. But then you need to approximate, because starting in any arbitrary state is exponentially long. You can reach any arbitrary state uh, exactly, but it's going to be an exponentially long implementation. So we need to approximate. So the user needs to tell us whether it needs 99% accuracy or 90% or accuracy and so on. This is a circuit for 90% accuracy, 95%, 99. And of course, we can deal with this approximation on the fly when we are writing down the circuits. So all this is fine, but now this is where the superconductivity comes about or the superconducting hardware or the ion hardware, but this is where the details of the actual implementation come about. Uh, uh, it's not enough for me to say that I want 99% accuracy and therefore I will create this long circuit for state preparation. If the hardware guys tell me that on the specific qubits that my machinery decided to use for the state preparation, the fidelity is 97, there is no reason for me to create a long algorithm. So I need to do fidelity calculations and I won't go into it. So I do all the fidelity calculations according to the qubits that I'm going to place. When I say I, I mean the machinery. That the machinery is going to place this part of the algorithm on those qubits. I need to do all the fidelity calculations if the hardware gives me, and by the way, IBM is very, very open about their fidelities. No other companies are like that as far as I know. But if I know all the, uh, as much about the noise model as I should, then I can do all those complex calculations which take account the fidelity of the algorithm and the fidelity of the hardware and find my sweet spot. So this is another calculation that I do. And then I find that suppose those are imaginary numbers, but just to give the point, I find that for a state preparation circuit, which by the way extends longer, uh, with some fidelity, and if I want overall fidelity of say 99.6, and I have C not fidelity of 10 to the minus 6, I see that I cannot fit it on 8 qubits because I would need too much long circuit and the hardware noise will kill me. But if I add two more qubits, auxiliary qubits, I can minimize or reduce my C not gates, and then I'm okay with the fidelity of the hardware still being in line with the fidelity that I request for the algorithm. Uh, so this is the play of that we are doing. The same goes, this, this by the way, when I mentioned answer says for VQEs, this is not, it seems, the look and feel of, the ha of, of this talk is like long term, when we will have very complex circuits. That's correct, but we already starting to have complex circuits already today in a few answer sets. Answer sets are not that simple when you want to make them smart, and totalization are, is part sometimes of, of answer sets, so you can play with approximation of totalization and so on. And let's finish, you know, uh, I, I have some time, so finish with some consideration. So all those things, yes, uh, people have been doing it like for decades, in, not only in hardware, in, in, in any design, in design in a, a vehicle, design bridges, there are design considerations. It's a trade-off, it's a world of trade-off, and all those things should be taken into account and what we call design space exploration should be done before implementing anything. So those are the parameters of interest in design space exploration. Most, most of them we touched. T-gate count is very important when dealing with error correction. T-gates, as you know, are very um, um, expensive to generate in its state distillation and so on. And if we put them all together and look at the results, and those results are without hardly any tuning, and it's fine because the methodology is different. It's not that we needed to tune anything. So taking state-of-the-art results with transpiler optimization for, you know, the, the most, I think, the most widespread benchmark 
of quantum computing, which is the water molecule with the regular, you know, one such as and DQE schemes and whatever. So we get the exact same results. So there is no issue here of maybe the results were better or worse or whatever. The exact same results, the exact same functionality, but uh, with uh, one half, um, one half the gates, uh, 50 50 percent reduction without, you know, any tuning. Um, uh, uh, from looking at the functional level instead of looking at the implementation. Ah, I see you stand up, so I will finish what in two minutes? Five minutes, okay. So we can have a few jokes in the three minutes. Um, I, I try to finish. Um, so 50% so, so, uh, um, reduction just by looking at the problem differently and looking at where to do the optimization differently. I won't go into those results, but I can tell you that for the next exchange, solving in, in eight iterations, we've seen it's related to the talk from AD, uh, solving it in eight iterations, this particular problem, I won't go into it, is something again, which was able to be done because of the different way of looking at things. Uh, this is a sad problem, SET problem, uh, written naively would take 300 qubits, Doing it by hand, you can improve, but this is automatically improving to 171 QB, mainly by the uncomputation ideas that I showed earlier. Um, uh, just to show that there are also industrial um, uh, issues and uh, problems, I won't go into it. Okay, this is the only slide about our company. Uh, so, so, so this is our part. We provide a way to write high-level models the way to write constraints, everything, there is so much to do. There is 60 works ahead to do. But we are doing the first steps and I think we are quite succeeding in it. This is the main technology part that I've just shown you. The output can be any gate level circuit, it doesn't matter. Uh, it can also, without going through the um, uh, gate level languages, go directly to any of the hardwares, any of the common hardwares, but typically people want to see what they got and debug and understand and so on, so we also provide this. Of course, we are keep on relying on the hardware providers, compilers and transpilers, because we need the access to the compute and what compilers and transpilers do, they do great. They are very much optimized to a particular hardware, so we do use them. Um, I won't go into this about how we do it. This slide actually says that if anyone will invite me to another talk about the how, there is 45 minutes of talk about how we do that. Quite interesting, actually. And the take-home message is that describing the functionality of a circuit is fundamentally different then describing the gate level implementation, and obviously what people describe today, typically when they say quantum algorithm, they describe gate level implementations. So the point is that you should keep in mind that you can describe a circuit differently. And if you keep this division, it allows to incorporate optimization where the automation is really asked for and intended and scale both in size and complexity, and I thank you very much for this. <laughs>